I want to welcome you all to a special edition of Fridays with Friedlander today. We're celebrating the remarkable career of a nurse, Lois Burkhardt, who's been with our department for 43 years and will be retiring in the coming days and weeks. We will miss her very much. He, she has made a tremendous impact for so long. She's seen so much of the history of our illustrious department, really seeing how we've changed over the years. Uh, Dr. Paul Gardner, who's worked with her for many years, will be interviewing her today, going over her career. Now, for me personally, I met Lois when I first arrived here almost 12 years ago now, and she's been a bedrock of stability within the cranial service and really for nursing in general and for our department. She's knowledgeable, she's always there, she has a smile, contagious laugh and smile, which is always great. And obviously for our patients, she's been tremendous. Many of our patients meet us in the worst day of their lives pretty much and their families. And the empathy that she projects uh, to everybody um, really is, is uh, tremendous. We'll certainly miss her after her retirement. We wish her the best uh, for a well-deserved uh, rest and I'll leave you with uh, the interview. So thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for being here with us today. If this is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander, we've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former trainees. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. If you have any questions or comments after watching this broadcast, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week we're highlighting uh, a special broadcast. Uh, one of our extraordinary and very accomplished long-term department nurses of 43 years, Lois Burkhardt. Lois has spent her entire career caring for patients in cranial-based surgery at the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. So we saw it fitting that Dr. Paul Gardner, the neurosurgical director of the Center for Cranial-Based Surgery, would just have an open discussion with Lois about the journey she's been on during her career in the department. As for that, Dr. Gardner and Lois, thank you and please take it away. Thank you, Justin. This, this is a, a very special uh, Fridays, I think, a, a special discussion conversation. It's not something we probably recognize or talk about enough, but this is the first skull-based center in all of North America. It's the longest running skull-based center in all of North America. And it has been run uh, from a nursing perspective by one person that entire time. Uh, we've had uh, multiple surgeons who had different developments along the way, but as far as caring for patients and managing this, this has been done by one person, Lois Burkhart, the entire time. And that's absolutely remarkable. She plays a huge role in our success. She plays a huge role in our consistency over time and knows as much about any of this as uh, really anybody in the country. So uh, I wanted to have a conversation with her as she's thinking about bringing her career to a close uh, and try to understand what that process has been like um, and uh, just to sort of show how critical this role is. And I wanted to start off, Lois, by asking you, how did you become interested in nursing in the first place? Uh, you know, a couple of years ago. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I always wanted to be a teacher when I grew, grew up, but one of my best friends across the street wanted to be a doctor. So her mother thought it would be good for her to go to the hospital environment and be a candy striper. So my mother thought, let's get her out of the house. Let's have her do it too. So my friend and I, Lisa, we went to Allegheny General and we were candy stripers and we helped the nurses. We made lots of beds passed out lots of water pitchers. And one day one of the nurses said to me, you know, Mrs. Gray is an elderly woman. She doesn't have any family. Would you mind going in and just spending some time with her? So I thought, sure, that's fine. I'm, it's volunteer work. So I went in and she wasn't real open to conversation at first, but then we got to talking and she didn't have any family. So she looked at me and she said, do you know how to braid hair? And I said, I do. And so we, her hair was so disheveled. So we got all the tangles out. She put it in a ponytail. I braided her ponytail. And then I, it was time for me to leave. So I left. So the next day I came in early because I thought I would spend some time with her. And when I went into the room, it was empty. 
So as I was going up the hall, the nurse called me into her office and told me that she had passed away. But after I left, she called the nurse into the room and she wanted, she said, please tell Lois, thank you for coming in to help me look more presentable when I meet my maker. So she went to sleep that night and passed away in her sleep. And you had no idea even that she was that sick. No. Wow, what an incredible. No, so I went home and I said to my mom, I want to be a nurse. Wow. So my mother at that time had bone marrow cancer. She was in remission. And so she had an oncology appointment the next day. So she asked her oncologist and all the nurses, where's the best nursing school? And they told her that the shift in nursing was to get a Bachelor of Science. So don't go to a nursing school, go to a college. So then we started looking at colleges and we chose uh, Edinburgh. So Edinburgh is up near Erie. So um, it was a snow belt, lots of snow. And that's where I learned to drive in snow, but it's flat. It's not like Pittsburgh. <laughs> Other than the snow, what, what challenges do you have getting into nursing, you know, going through school and getting into nursing? What, uh, what did you run into? Was it an easy path, no problem? Or? Uh, no, I had a rough course. So my senior year, the fall semester, I worked with a professor that we just did not get along. We butted heads. She was super critical. My mother used to call the dean every day to complain about this professor. So they had a, a pass fail. You couldn't get like an A or a B. It was a pass fail. So I was struggling. And so my mother would call the dean and complain. And so one of my roommates was also in nursing, but she had a different instructor. So there's a, a, a nursing process, which is a, which is a conversation when you sit down and talk to a patient. You write down what they say, and then you tell, tell people why in the next column why they said what they did. And then you put down what you say, and then why you said what you did. So Jackie and I paired them together. She got a B, I got a D. So I went to the dean and I said, look, if you look at this, there, there's you know, something wrong. I'm doing things right, but the professor just, we don't see eye to eye. To eye. And she said, you know, no, it's fine. So um, Christmas break, I got my grades and found out that I failed. So my mother, of course, immediately called the dean and she called her every day over Christmas break. <laughs> trying to persuade her to allow me to go forward. Because if you failed, you couldn't continue in the spring semester. So um, finally, the dean agreed. Okay. So this one kept you from becoming a nurse? Yes. So um, she said, fine, we'll let her go through. She'll have to retake the fall semester and graduate in December. That was fine. So I went to, back up to Edinburgh, my dad took me up, we unpacked all of my things. I got a call from the dean that she wanted to see me. So I went over to the dean's office and she said, the Board of Nursing has met and you cannot go any further. You're going to have to reapply next year. So I went back to the dorm, packed up all my things and went home. And she, the dean also said, please tell your mother not to call me. This is a final decision. So I went home and then didn't quite know what to do. Now, during the college season and the summer sessions, there was a manpower agency that my mother was a secretary. She believed everybody should have typing skills and that type of organizational things in your life. So manpower was they would hire temps out for business to do typing, filing, organization, anything and everything. So I got a job at uh, the steel building um, at Metropolitan Life. So it was a lot of just insurance company mm -hmm, filing claims. So I was talking to the supervisor and told him what happened. And he said, let me get some claims. So he got some claims. He said, OK, if a person has this diagnosis, would a doctor order this test? And I said, yes. He said, what about this and this? I said, mm, that doesn't make sense. He said, why don't you quit manpower and we'll hire you to do claims. So I said, okay, that's fine. So I worked there a month 
but my mom started to get sicker. Her counts were dropping and she passed away in March. So it was that moment that I knew why I had failed nursing was to be home with my mom. Wow. So I continued to work at Metropolitan Life and they, I, I think I worked there for four weeks. They promoted me to the sickness and accident claim department where I had to call physicians to find out why their patients weren't back to work yet. Lots of physicians hung up on me. Uh, not happy was, about that, yeah. No, <clears throat> but it was okay. Yeah. And so I was running late and I was running to get my bus and I ran into a former colleague of mine who told me that they had fired both the dean and the professor. So I went home that night and I told my dad and my dad looked at me and said, you're going back to school. That's incredible. Wow. So I went back to Edinburgh and went through smooth sailing. No problem whatsoever. So the only consequence ended up being that you actually were off when your mother was that sick. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's powerful. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think uh, 43 years and what you've built here says a lot about that professor. And yes, that team, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, well, how did you end up in neurosurgery and more importantly in this subspecialty of skull based surgery, which actually didn't even exist, uh, certainly in the US and maybe anywhere when you started? Mm -hmm. So I went to the different hospitals and, and did my interviews and when I came to Presby, Presby was offering $5.25 an hour. AGH only offered $5 an hour. So I decided, well, I'll just interview here at Presby. They told me that they had two departments open, cardiology, which did not appeal to me, but more interestingly was neurosurgery. And they told me there's a six bed unit, it's called the porch. Yeah. It used to be a sun porch and you got more intensive training so you could go to an ICU eventually if you needed to. So I decided I'd go into neurosurgery and when I used to work nights, it was interesting because the interns would get there right at 6 a.m. I remember Mark Linsky promptly 6 a.m. every morning with his green book bag and we would go around and make rounds on all patients. So, but I also found out why there was openings in neurosurgery. It was because of the head nurse. So all the old time residents that remember Sharon Sell, she was a dictator. <laughs> she ran a tight ship, but she helped mold me into the nurse I am That's today. great, good for her. Yeah, she was very, very rigid, and but she was pro patient care, made sure that all like team three was the quads, the two feeds, the trachs, and she made sure that every patient got turned every two hours. She made her rounds. If somebody wasn't turned, she would come find you. A kind of passion is really what it takes. Yeah, yeah it really does. So I worked on the floor for about nine and a half years and took care of a lot of Shaker and Sens patients and just could not believe what these people were going through. The Shaker and Sen are the, the first two neurosurgeons uh, here in Pittsburgh basically developed the field of skull based surgery in North America, in my opinion, or at least played the largest role in it and came up with uh, the ways to even get to some of these tumors. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Shaker came up to me and said, you know, Lois, I'm thinking about hiring a nurse to help with our patients. I get many, many phone calls. I'm in the OR for long hours. And I said, is it Monday through Friday? He said, yes. I said, no weekends, no holidays? He said, yes. I said, I'm there. So he said, well, you have to interview first. I said, okay. So I interviewed and got the job and became the first nurse coordinator for the Department of Neurosurgery. So they made it a Presby position as opposed to a Pitt. Pitt positions, you weren't allowed to write verbal orders. Mm -hmm. And I basically, the first week that I started, they had no place for me to sit. So I sat in the division administrator's office in a chair beside her desk and read up all of Shaker and Sen's articles. And then I, I had no job description. That's a lot of articles. <laughs> yeah, um, no job description. So then I started to make rounds with patients. And so I used to spend hours in these people's rooms just learning what, 
how did they come to Pittsburgh? What symptoms did they have? And it was just remarkable that Shaker and Sen had this outreach throughout the United States yeah. of where to go. And I still have a patient of Shaker's who had a cavernous sinus meninge in 1986 removed. She calls me every September on the anniversary of her surgery to thank me again for taking care of her. That's fantastic. So you basically developed what it means to be a nurse coordinator for that. It didn't yes. exist. That's yeah, we finally got a job description together and I basically almost functioned as a resident. Yeah, it sounds like it. How, how many nurse coordinators are there in our department now, do you know? Or just at Presby even? Do you have any idea? No, I don't. Yeah, it's it's so many we can't count, right? Probably. I mean, every subspecialty has count. them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, you know, why why stay in this department? Why stay in this hospital, this subspecialty, you know, for your entire career? And what did you enjoy about that? So one of the things that, that I really loved was going into the OR. When I used to go into the OR, I would I would not know what I was looking at. And there were these tricky areas that Shaker and Sen were reaching that to see them in the OR and then to see them post-op, it was like night and day. And whenever I walked into the OR, Chandra would always, Dr. Sen would stop and say, nose, eyes, mouth. So I had an idea. And one of the reasons why I stayed, even though others have gone on, is I was just so comfortable with my position and I loved taking care of these patients because they're in such intricate areas that I just didn't want to go anywhere else. It's hard to imagine that uh, you can pull it off sometimes. Yeah. Do you ever wish you'd done something different? No, I don't think so. That's um, great. Uh, you know, and I, I know that you've run into this, but Shaker and Sen back then had a lot of controversy. Um, yeah. They, I went to the first North American Skull Base Society meeting when I first started here and learned a lot with just other presentations. And then the second meeting, um, Dr. Shaker thought that I should promote the nurse coordinator and how beneficial I am. And when we used to make rounds, he used to always go up to Dr. Janetta and say, Peter, see, we're making rounds you could do this too because I have a nurse, you do not. So eventually Peter hired a nurse coordinator and he hired Sharon Sell. Oh wow. Yeah. That's and, then, <laughs> and then after Shaker left, um, Janetta called me into his office and said, regardless if you stay or go, if you don't go with Dr. Shaker, we always have a, a, a job for you. So that's one thing the department has always been there for me. So I felt I should be there for them. What's what's it like to have been the consistent thread in this subspecialty that didn't exist when you started? You helped make it what it is, and you've been through three or four generations now of surgical teams mm -hmm. um, that do skull based surgery. What's what's that been like? Well, I feel blessed that I only work with the best neurosurgeons, um, and it's comforting because I'm so comfortable in my role, I don't really think about it, but I am a great resource to others. I know who to call and when and where, and it's just been an enjoyable experience. And I try to pass along knowledge um, with you know the MBDs and with skull base tours, and I try to help out where, where I'm needed. And it's just been a, a great ride. Yeah, I think it's hard to uh, hard to overstate the importance of what you do as part of this process. And I am quite sure that there are a million little things that are of critical importance to patients and to us that we don't even know you do. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure of that. Um, well, what what will you do uh, you know, once you move on from this? So when I retire, so um, I used to sew a lot. 
And I kind of put that aside after Sarah was born, don't want her to eat the pins or anything. So I'm going back to sewing. Uh, also, I've been taking out books on decluttering your house. <laughs> so, so I have that in mind as well. But I just want to kind of relax and, and ease into it. Well, well earned. We, we could both stand to declutter our desks too. I know uh, that unless... Yeah, well, it's going to take me a while to yeah. pack up. To figure that out. <laughs> what, uh, what do you think you'll miss most in retirement? I'll miss the people um, and the patients. Uh, as the patients are coming to clinic, the ones that I see continuously, um, I've told them about my retirement, so we've kind of reminisced, and so I'm saying my goodbyes, and it's it's sad. Yeah, I, yeah it's, I mean, I can't tell you how much you'll be missed. <laughs> I don't think I can possibly even, can't put it to words. Um, what would you tell a new nurse who's thinking about getting to nursing or neurosurgery or even skull-based surgery, what advice would you give them? Um, I tell them always keep the patients first. You have to really listen and direct your focus towards them and they'll be fine. And try to learn something every day. Try to make sure that when you're doing your teaching that they have a thorough understanding and it's a great field and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Sort of something we didn't really talk about or uh, bring up that comes to mind, you know, nursing right now is in a crisis because mm -hmm. of COVID. A lot of people have left because it is an extraordinarily difficult job. It's mm -hmm. not always as rewarding as it should be by a long shot. Mm -hmm. um, you faced almost endless challenges and most people would have given up. So what, you know, what can we do to try to reverse that? Um, and what can we do to try to bring good people like yourself into nursing? Or, or what should we be doing? What, to, you know, what yeah. would you tell those people? That's a good question. Um, I, I think there are some people who are born to be nurses and those that are not. And as long, you know, sometimes I don't know if it's trying to split between working in the hospital setting and then working at home, trying to get a little bit of a break in between there to maintain sanity, but- Some balance, huh? Yeah, there has to be some balance. You know, when working 10, 12 hour days, you, I kind of um, listen to music on the way home and keep the volume up a little bit so that I can process things. Yeah. So before I go home. Yeah, there's so much you take up from patients mm -hmm. um, emotionally and uh, absorb from them or or help them to understand or deal with it's right. uh, uh, it's endless uh, endless task. Um, you know, I think that uh, I think that it has to be a calling, and I think that's what you describe is that this was clearly a calling for you, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what's made you so great at it, and I think that's also why. At the end of your career, you can say something a lot of people can't say, which is they wouldn't have done anything different at all and uh, truly have a rewarding career. So um, I want to thank you. I can't tell you how much you'll be missed. Uh, it's, it's, you. it's true. And you are the heart and soul of, of this program and the heart and soul of skull based surgery, not only here in Pittsburgh, but honestly, it's clearly spread well beyond. Every skull base center has a nurse coordinator mm -hmm. and it, I, I believe, started here. So yeah. thank you for everything you've done and still do. You're very welcome. I figured it took me so long to get here. And I think that's why I stayed here 43 years. <laughs> so oh, I'm very glad that you did. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Robert. Thank you again, uh, Lois and Dr. Gardner. What a fun and incredible presentation. Uh, Lois, congratulations on a wonderful career helping countless patients and colleagues along the way. Uh, thank you to our viewers. Uh, again, if you have any questions or would like to learn about ways to support the Department of Neurosurgery, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. We look forward to seeing you, our viewers, on our future broadcasts. Thank you and be well.